Top Bird Talk. It's now my pleasure to introduce um, Professor Ramani Munasinghe, Professor at uh, UCL, um, also Director of the Health Services Research Centre at uh, the Royal College of Anesthetists uh, and the Chief Investigator on the PQIP programme, uh, a number of other national roles uh, and, and very much seen as a thought leader in perioperative care. So it's a, a delight to hear Five slides, ten minutes on risk assessment. Thanks, Mike. Good evening, everyone. What I hope to do is provide some practical tips that you can take away to uh, implement in your hospital. Some might take a few days and some might take the rest of your careers, but we'll see. And the point of this is to try and think about how we individually risk assess the patient that's standing in front of you or sitting in front of you in whatever context, whether it's in the preoperative assessment clinic, whether it's in the MDT meeting about the decision to surgery being made, for surgery being made, whether it's on the morning of the surgery. Um, In the United Kingdom, there is a legal imperative to do this now called the Montgomery ruling. Uh, But wherever you are in the world, I think it's good practice to try and individualise patient risks to that patient. And we've already had great presentations and discussion about um, advanced care planning and so on, and all of these things uh, come together. Um, So uh, my five top tips. The first thing is just think about why you're doing it, and then part that will... um, depend a little bit on the timing of of, of when you're going to do this. So you might be doing it because you want to pick out the patients who you can select for some type of optimisation. So, for example, the sexy stuff at the moment is around prehabilitation. So if they're physically unfit, if they've got low cardiorespiratory reserve, you might want to put them on an exercise training programme. If they're malnourished, you might want to give them some nutritional intervention. If they're obese, you might want to screen them or evaluate their risk of uh, type 2 diabetes or obstructive sleep apnea. Um, If they've got lifestyle challenges, so if they smoke or they drink excessive amounts of alcohol, you might choose to um, intervene or try to intervene in those cases. Um, The second reason that you might be doing it, and perhaps the most important reason, is to facilitate the process of shared decision-making on the treatment options uh, with the patient, um, and also to ensure that the patient is adequately consented for their procedure. Um, Now, we can do this on the basis of global risk assessment, so morbidity and mortality. Uh, It is to our shame, really, that we don't have very good long-term outcome data in most surgical procedures, uh, which tells us about the quality of life that patients have six months, 12 months or longer down the line after major surgical interventions. And there are various initiatives that are trying to address that now, but that is an area in which data are lacking. And even more to our shame, really, is the fact that we don't have very good data on the alternatives in many cases. So there are some great studies out there about shared decision-making and clinical decision tools and how they've been used to help patients make a decision between surgery and non-surgical interventions and mortality and morbidity data uh, followed up up to a year after those sorts of uh, shared decision-making interventions. Um, But for lots of procedures, we we don't know what the alternatives are. And then the final reason that you might be risk assessing a patient is because you might select them for particular perioperative interventions once they actually come into hospital. So that might be, for example, that you choose to send them to the post anaesthetic care unit for invasive hemodynamic monitoring. You might choose to give them some respiratory support. You might just want to nurse them in in an area which has a higher nurse-patient ratio than a normal post-operative ward. The second tip, I guess, is that um, risk assessment is really a communication tool. Um, so, uh, and it enables you to communicate with your colleagues um, and also with your patients. Um, now, the communication with colleagues thing is an interesting one. A, a little bit about how one communicates risk of an individual patient to colleagues will depend a little bit on who you are. So, if you're the uh, most junior member of the surgical team, my guess is that the senior professor of surgery is not going to take your opinion so seriously um, if it is simply based on your opinion. Um, Whereas if you present the senior professor of surgery with some objective data, whether that's from a risk scoring tool or an exercise test or any number of other different ways in which you can assess risk, then you might have a better chance of getting their attention. Um, There are lots and lots of different objective ways in which we can assess risk, and perhaps in the conversation um, after my presentation we can discuss some of those. Um, The MET study, which Mike was involved with and and, um, many of you will have read, uh, which was published in The Lancet last year, looked at uh, objective versus subjective ways of evaluating functional capacity in patients prior to surgery. And its conclusions were several, but one of the key conclusions was that clinicians are really rubbish at assessing functional capacity in patients. And we can maybe talk about why that might be. And so if one is going to bother to assess functional capacity, one should use an objective measure, whether that's 
a Duke Activity Status Index or a six-minute walk test or an exercise test. The SNAP2 study which I was involved with, which is in submission for publication at the moment, had a slightly different finding where objective measures were found to be very good, so things like the Surgical Outcome Risk Tool, which is a very simple risk calculator, was found to be a very highly accurate predictor of 30-day mortality. But clinician judgment was also pretty good. But the difference there was the context. So the MDT, at the time of surgery, was asked to come to a collective decision about how high risk the patient was and what their risk of 30-day mortality was. That is quite a different scenario to the usual setting, which I certainly experience in my institution, which is that either I'm making an assessment of the patient on my own, or the surgeon is on his or her own, or the nurse is on his or her own. And so we don't generally come together to make those collective decisions, and that's a real failing of many of our systems at the moment. Communication with the patient is super important and and an area which um, I think is under-researched. So using lay language, I guess, is obvious, but but even how one uses that language. So we're all aware of the... um, The problem that one has when one is trying to convey that the patient has a 10% risk of death in 30 days, which we all consider to be super high and might turn us away from surgery, but but what the patient hears is a 90% risk of survival. And so conveying the risk in that way is actually quite a challenge and might require an individualised approach to that patient depending on their level of health literacy and general literacy. The other thing that's critically important is thinking about which outcomes we want to convey to the patient. So a a brief story, Um, I saw a patient in my pre-assessment clinic a few weeks ago. Um, He was listed for a repair of an anterior cutaneous fistula, so he'd had a mesh repair of a hernia many years ago, and the hernia had basically worked its way out to the free world, and so he had horrible stuff gushing out of his uh, bowel, and his life was a misery, and he couldn't go out uh, because he couldn't get the bags to fit over his wound and all that stuff. And so he'd come for an anterior cutaneous fistula repair, um, but he had um, an... uh, implanted defibrillator and an uh, ejection fraction of 10%. 10%. Um, So uh, the surgeon had said to him, you've got a 25% risk of death. And the patient had said to the surgeon, I don't care, my life is not worth living, I want this operation. What the surgeon hadn't said to him is that because his functional reserve was so appallingly low, the chances of the operation being successful were almost zero because he wouldn't have the functional reserve for the wound to heal. And so having had a different conversation with the patient about the individual risks to him, the patient had a different approach to whether or not he wanted to go ahead with the surgery. The third top tip is to think about risk assessment not as a perfect tool. We need to understand the limitations of it. Um, And when uh, the risk assessment doesn't quite then lead to the same results as we were expecting, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So all that using an objective risk assessment tool, whether it's a CPET test or a walking test or any number of other tests does, is it it narrows the range of, it narrows the normal distribution for a group of patients with that uh, prediction. So it takes you from the graph on the left, which is the normal distribution for all patients having an elective AP resection. And this is the stuff that we see written on consent forms all the time you've got a 1% risk of a DVT and a 2% risk of a wound infection because those are the population risks. And all that doing an individualised risk assessment does is it takes you over to the graph on the right-hand side where you can see that normal distribution has been narrowed. So your, um, your confidence intervals are narrowed, which means that you can make a more precise prediction about the chances of that patient have a, having a particular outcome. But it is still a normal distribution, so there will still be some patients on the fringes of that curve rather than the middle of it. And those are the patients who sometimes surprise us, either in a good way or a bad way. So no risk prediction tool is perfect, and no risk prediction tool will ever be perfect. Even when we use genetic testing in the future, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all this crazy clever stuff that's on the doorstep, uh, unexpected things will still happen. That means that the outcome is not necessarily what we might have predicted it to be. And that brings me on to my second point, is if we think about risk and outcome, there are patient factors, and we've spent a long time this afternoon discussing what those might be, comorbidities, frailty, whatever you want to call it. And some of those are unmeasured, and some of those are unknown. So we don't know genetic profiles of patients. We don't know how that may or may not affect their short, medium, and long-term outcome. We don't know everything that's important, And some of the stuff that we have a hunch might be important, we generally don't measure, like, for example, psychological preparedness. And then there are the operative or the perioperative factors. So is this patient likely to be technically challenging for the surgeon? 
Uh, are there likely to be technical issues that make the operation more high risk? And some of these will be unpredictable, of course. But the third thing that affects that relationship between risk and outcome is the quality of care that we give the patients. So if risk and outcome was a direct relationship that could not be changed, then we may as well not bother going to work in the morning. We go to work in order to improve the chances that our patients will get a good outcome by doing all the stuff that we've talked about this afternoon and that you'll talk about over the next few days. So it stands to reason that if a patient who was expected to do badly does well, it's not that it was a failure of risk assessment, it was that it was a success of risk assessment, and it's likely that we took measures to try and optimise that patient's chances of surviving, getting out of hospital, and going back to their previous life. And then finally, and this is the bit that might take the next 25 years, is that thinking about your systems in your own hospital, uh, your own region, depending on what level you work at, is a critical thing. So when should we be risking, risk assessing patients? Before, during, and after their operation? And how do we do that? How do we put the systems in place to make sure that risk assessment is done uh, not just once, but regularly to pick up patients as their trajectories change? How, before, how soon before the operation can we do this? Um, we are all frustrated by seeing the patient who's been worked up in some way or another for six or 12 months presenting on the morning of surgery and their HbA1c is 8%, but they've got cancer and so you can't optimise them any further, so you've got to get on with it. So what is the earliest point at which we can identify the patient in the perioptive pathway? And I'll come back to that in a minute. And then the final point is thinking about your system in your hospital and who should be involved in all of this. It's clear to me that the best outcomes for patients will be achieved by multidisciplinary teams working together. We all know that to be the case. But why is it that we don't do this bit of it regularly with the involvement of both surgeons, anaesthetists and clinical nurse practitioners and whoever else should be involved? And nurse-led screening and then possibly medical specialist review as required is probably the most practical way of doing this. This could be the idealised pathway. So you screen for potentially high-risk patients at the point of secondary care referral. Patient has a hernia, patient has PR bleeding, patient's had an aneurysm discovered on screening. At that point, it's straightforward for somebody to just take a list of their comorbidities and try and work out if they're an ASA1 patient or not. You can then implement a variety of completely free risk calculators, whether it's the Nisquick calculator, the SORT, the Duke Activity Status Index, or whatever it is, to try and get a slightly more detailed assessment of whether or not the patient is at risk. You then might choose to move on to a specific, slightly more... Um, uh, expensive potentially and detailed investigation whether it's a CPET test or other investigations straightforward stuff like haemoglobin and HbA1c measurement and more complex ones like echoes or whatever you think are necessary depending on the patient the key thing is to start the optimization while people are still trying to work out what's wrong with them because the optimization bit is very very unlikely to be bad for the patient if the patient's got high blood pressure, they need to have their blood pressure treated. If they've got a high HbA1c, they need to have that sorted out. If they smoke, it would be of benefit to them to be sent for some smoking cessation therapy if they're prepared to accept it. So it seems to me very unlikely that these sorts of interventions, even in patients who end up not having surgery, could be a risk. We then can make a multidisciplinary decision with uh, the whole team and the patient about what to do next, plan the perioptive pathway based on the risk assessment, and then critically reassess at regular intervals before the operation, so a bit like the advanced care planning, uh, doing a risk assessment six months before surgery, if it's a long wait operation, may not be enough. You may want to revisit the patient three months before the operation or two months just to check nothing's changed. During the uh, surgical procedure immediately afterwards, there's a whole bunch of different things that we can do in terms of surveillance for high-risk patients after surgery as well. So I'm going to move on from that, and that's me done. Thank you. Top Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence based perioptive medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.